thrilled to um, be having this conversation, which we hope to be the first of several conversations. The topic of reentry, how we operate in the pandemic is not something that we can solve and resolve in one phone call. So, um, but we're really, really glad that you're all here right now for this talk. So let's, let's go over um, who's on the call and what to expect. Um, we, let's see, I want to first start out by introducing the CDSS staff that will be joining us. In a moment, we'll hear from Sarah Pilzer, who is our Director of Operations at CDSS, with some tech tips for interacting on this web chat. We also have um, Crispin Youngberg, our Office and Camp Registrations Manager. He is um, managing breakout rooms and attendees. Nikki Perez, our membership coordinator, is attending and helping with the slides. And Linda Henry, our community resources manager, is um, keeping us all uh, coordinated together. Uh, Linda usually hosts our web chats, but I'm hosting today. Um, and now, actually, before we go any further, let's hand it over to Sarah and get a quick rundown of tech tips for engaging in this web chat. Great. Nikki, can we have the next slide, please? Hi everyone, uh, welcome. A few things to mention. We, we've said this if you were here already, but if you're just joining us, please keep your microphone uh, muted and video off um, when you're not speaking. We will have time at the end to share videos, but for the first half, we ask that um, folks cut back on bandwidth and have their mics muted and video off. Uh, next slide, Nikki. Um, we suggest if you are unfamiliar with Zooms, there's two views. There's gallery view and speaker view. Um, gallery view will let you see everyone. Um, right now, uh, we're just going to have one person speaking at a time, so it's fine to be in speaker view, but at the end, when we're um, together in breakout rooms, we suggest that you switch to gallery view. To do that, um, next slide, you can just click in the upper right hand corner, there's a little box that either says gallery view or speaker, and if you click on that, it'll toggle back and forth between those views. Next slide, please. So this is what gallery view would look like. Next slide. If you want to go back, click again. Next slide. And it'll go back to speaker view. Next slide. Um, we will be taking questions um, or comments using the chat bar. If you're unfamiliar with that, next slide. You can click down at the bottom. Next slide. Uh, there's a little icon, a speech bubble that'll say chat. And that's going to open up the chat bar on the right hand side of your screen. Next slide, please. You can type a message into the bottom of the chat window and that'll go to um, the folks in uh, the chat room. You can specify who it goes to by changing the little to icon. Um, one could be you yeah. can either send it to an individual privately or to everyone in the meeting. For questions to the panelists, please send those to everyone in the meeting, which it should be the default. Um, we'll have time at the end to take questions. So if you have questions during the, um, during the presentation, please hold them until we get to the question and answer section. Otherwise, I'll probably lose them in the chat. <laughs> we will be we are recording this, both um, the video portion and the chat, so if we happen to miss a question, we'll come back to it later. Um, more on that later. All right, I think that is my portion. Fantastic. You, Katie. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I had muted myself because I was trying to be very well behaved. Okay, so yeah, I just want to give a few quick opening remarks before we turn it over to our wonderful guests today. Um, as many of you know, we started hosting web chats in 2019 as a new way for organizers from dance music and song communities to connect, share ideas, be inspired. Um, at our last web chat this April, we, um, which the topic was staying connected through the pandemic, um, we heard a lot of participants asking more for more guidance and information on the big questions around coming back together. Um, we also since then have conducted our annual affiliate survey and that's a really big influencer of our annual work plan. Um, so we learned some, we had uh, predictably some questions about the impacts of the pandemic on their operations. And there's some bits of information I think are interesting. Uh, we will be releasing a, a larger report on that, on the affiliate survey, but this is just a little tidbit or sneak preview. Um, we've been thinking a lot about 
how is our sector going to ride this out? What, what are we going to see when it's over? Um, we were really happy to see that 84% of responders to that survey um, agreed to the statement that we have enough financial cushion to carry us through this time. I don't know what this time meant to all the responders and that's something maybe we could shore up next year. But the fact is we have financial stability. There is a small percentage of, of organizations that do not feel that way and we are going to reach out to them and see if we can help um, folks get through this time uh, as much as we can. Um, but even though there's financial stability, we still saw that over half, 53% of the respondents um, are deeply are concerned that people will not come back after this pandemic for a variety of reasons. So it's not just about financial stability, it's about um, staying connected and, and what are we gonna do? How are we gonna help people come back and find us again? Um, another bit of information that stuck out to me uh, was that only 24% of respondees uh, reported that they're using this time to work on other aspects of their organizations or events that um, maybe have needed attention or get put off. Um, and that could include, you know, writing up volunteer job descriptions or trying to recruit new volunteers, um, looking at governance, trying to get more youth and young adult engagement in your decision making, implementing a new safety policy and procedure, um, or even doing training for uh, leadership, but we're all, this is a volunteer network. So these are the kinds of things that um, maybe aren't trickling to the top, but are really good I, things that we want people to start thinking about. We've also had a lot of in, questions from, our, um, from the callers and affiliates that get insurance from us about coverage and liability. So we did send out an email today. If you're an affiliate or caller that gets insurance from us, please check your email. Um, the bottom line is, if, uh, if, if there are events, if you're holding events or calling at events where, pub, where there are public health guidelines in effect, if that's the case, um, and those guidelines would discourage you or say that large gatherings are not allowed, insurance claims relating to COVID transmission will likely be denied by our insurance carrier. And that's probably gonna be true with a lot of insurance carriers. Um, so it's really important for, to stay on top of the guidelines um, in effect locally, um, state, and national, all levels. Um, and then also a lot of people asking, well, what if we have people sign waivers? So just to be, this is just business and before we get into the discussion, but signing waivers, having people sign waivers won't prevent you from being sued or and incurring the cost of defending yourself if you are sued. Waivers may be relevant and helpful though by adding another layer of protection during the deliberation or the trial. So signing waivers won't prevent um, hassle or cost. And so I just am taking this opportunity with 400 people to answer that question from the CDSS insurance perspective and I'm sure there will be more questions on that. Uh, you can reach out. Anyway. Let's move on to the discussion uh, where we hear from people who have joined us today. Um, Nikki, will you do the next slide, please? And for anyone uh, not viewing screens, I'll do my best, best to summarize the slides or the visuals that we're putting up. Um, and as we said, that this will be recorded. So please, uh, please um, make sure to turn your cameras off if you do not want to be recorded uh, when at the end of the web chat. Sorry, thank you. Okay, so here's an overview of the format we're following today. Um, we'll have a first section of about 40 minutes hearing from our guests. We have seven guests um, and they're all going to be covering different topics as we go through. Uh, keep track of the questions you have along the way. Um, at the end of that, we will be hosting a facilitated Q&A session. So that's a time where you can put those questions into the chat bar and Sarah will uh, read them and try to get as many as we can on a broad range of topics in about a 20 minute span. Then we're going to move to uh, an open discussion portion and it's really hard to do that with 400 people at once on Zoom. So we're pre, we, Crispin has pre-assigned people to breakout rooms. That's a time where you can turn your cameras on for sure and um, it's not guided or facilitated and you can take that discussion where you want. 
We'll come back together for a final five minute wrap up and then we will be good to go. So I think that covers all the logistics and I am ready to start hearing from the presenters. First up, we have Amy Schrader, who is an MD and a contra dancer from Chicago, Illinois. And um, we are really glad to have you, Amy, so take it away. All right, well, excited to be here. Um, so just to introduce yourself quickly, I am a family physician. I practice in, uh, in Chicago. And I'm also a dancer. I've been a dancer most of my adult life. Um, my, I don't work in an emergency room. I don't work in an ICU. I've, I work in an outpatient geriatric setting, and I've had a lot of patients who were sick with the coronavirus. Um, and I have had a few patients died from the coronavirus. Um, so I have, a, I think, an appreciation of how serious it can be. Um, also, I miss dancing desperately and I miss the dance community desperately. They've been a huge part of my life and uh, you know and I want to dance as much as anybody else does, as much as all the rest of you, I guarantee it. Um, so that's the perspective I have is I've seen what I can do and I also want to get back to my life. Um, so you know we're here to talk about reopening so um, I thought I would start by just talking about first of all just how the virus is spread just for you know basic information that we can all build from. Um, so the first um, the main idea of how the virus is spread is through droplets. And these are uh, respiratory droplets. They're larger droplets that are released when you cough or sneeze or laugh, probably sing also. And they dissipate over a few feet in a few seconds. So they, this is where the six foot distance idea comes from. Um, I wanna make sure y'all can hear me. <laughs> um, so the six foot social distancing, that's the idea that most droplets um, will have dissipated within the six feet, but they don't all. And um, also another thing to keep in mind is the closer you are, you know, one foot, there's a lot more droplets than there are six feet away from a person who has the virus. So the next thing that happens is, so after a few seconds, the, virus, the droplets drift down, they land on surfaces. And on the surfaces is where, you know, this is how you, you can touch them, you can have it on your hand, you touch your eye, you can get the virus through your eye, through mucous membranes on our face. Or you can touch the virus with your hand, you can shake hands with somebody else, they touch their eye um, through the mucous membranes on their face. So um, this is where all of the precautions about hand washing and hand sanitizer came from. Although now I think we've come to understand that this is not really a major mode of transmission of the virus. It, it definitely happens, but it's not the biggest thing to worry about. Um, now we have a new thing to worry about, which is aerosols. Um, it's, lately, it's become more and more of a discussion of how much the virus possibly is transmitted through aerosols, which um, really can be much more dangerous and much more infective. Um, the aerosols are tiny respiratory droplets. They're much smaller and they're lighter and they can float through the air over distances. Um, they can, it's thought that they stay in the air for about three, uh, three hours or maybe less. And they can also travel throughout a room. They can, we think that they can probably also go through like ventilation systems. Um, the other thing about the, the aerosols um, that's really concerning is that they, masks don't stop the aerosols. They're so small, they go right through most masks. The only masks that block them are the N95 masks that um, you know, the healthcare providers wear in really risky situations. Um, so thinking of that, um, you know, talking about masks, you know, the main reason that we've been told to wear masks from the beginning was this idea that the masks brought, blocked respiratory droplets from spreading. They block them from spreading from an infected person to the air around them. Um, but they, they don't really block you from getting the infection from someone else nearby. So they block the outgoing droplets, but not really the incoming droplets very much. There's some protection, not a lot. Um, so, um, so we're left with, you know, how to protect ourselves. We're left with, um, you know, the social distancing, staying more than six feet away from each other, which is hard to do when you're dancing and singing together, right? Um, and wearing the masks, which, um, you know, do a lot of good. Um, they do a lot of good for spreading the virus and, um, but they don't protect everybody and they don't work perfectly and they don't protect us from the aerosols. Um, so, um, oh, I wanted to also add, um, 
the one thing that's really important to recognize too is how much um, asymptomatic transmission there is. And so I hope that you're, you're all have heard way, a lot about this a lot, but that a lot of people that get the virus, most of the people in fact are, have very mild symptoms or none at all, and they're still infectious. So they can walk around spreading the virus and not know it. And that is the other really big reason that we should be wearing masks to prevent spreading it to other people when we don't even know we're sick. So um, a couple other things to think about just in terms of like how, um, what the risk of infection is. If you are around people that are, are infected and are spreading, um, one thing is how close you are to the person who is um, infected. So being a foot um, away from this person is much more, you're much more likely to get it than being six feet away. Um, the amount of time that you're in the, um, in the area of the infection. So it, five minutes is much less risky than 15 minutes or half an hour. And, um, and also the amount of virus that you're exposed to. So again, like the amount of virus that's in the air that you're breathing in and over the length of time. Okay, so that being said, I wanted to, um, so let's go back and think about a contra dance. Um, think about what happens at a contra dance. <laughs> um, and think about other kinds of dance too. It, um, but my, my main framework is Contra. And you know, this is a big community dance. Every time you, you come in, you are in a room full of your friends, you wanna hug everybody, you wanna dance with everybody. Um, and we really end up dancing with pretty much everybody in the room, right? We, um, we, people swing and you're about a foot away from each other face to face as you're swinging. And then you are, um, you, you go down the line and you swing with somebody else. And then you go down the line and you swing with somebody else. And what I picture when I, when I see this, besides the joy of dancing with all of your lovely friends, is I see a big a cloud of droplets <laughs> kind, of, kind of surrounding the counter line and people just moving through that cloud and breathing in all those droplets. And um, to me, that is just a very scary, dangerous idea. Um, and that I think the bottom line for me when I think about that is that, um, you know, I know you know, people are really desperate to get back to dancing and playing to, together and being with their communities. Um, but no matter how much we all really want to, um, we owe it to our communities, I, I believe, to, um, to keep our distance for now and to be, be safe and be aware of what the risks are and to, to do our best not to spread our infections that we don't, may not even know we have to our friends and communities. And also, if we go to a dance and you know, then we are exposed and we have a risk of bringing it back to the other people that we come into contact with. So it's not just our close community, but it's all of the people that all of our community interacts with, which is right. a huge circle. So that's, that's where I want to leave it, I think, for my thing. I think, um, you know, my bottom line is that, you know, I, I really don't think we'll, we'll be able to go back to dancing the way we did before until there's a vaccine and a herd immunity. Um, and, you know, I would love to hear other people's ideas about ways that we can work around that. Thank you, Amy. Thank okay. you. That's a perfect segue over to our next guest, um, Michael Warshaw. She is from Arlington, Virginia. She has a background in infectious disease epidemiology and is ready to talk about her experience as a contact tracer. Go, Michael. Oops, are you muted? Okay, the better way to start, I think. Um, thanks, Amy. That was a great way, a great segue into what I'm going to talk about. So I've been doing contact tracing for uh, the Division of Public Health in Arlington, Virginia since February, and I did it before for Ebola also. Um, but this has been a lot more than the Ebola tracing. Um, so let me just talk about how it works. So if somebody uh, tests positive for the coronavirus, and then we interview them and get a list of their contacts. And their contacts are people who have been within close, close range of them, um, you know, within six feet for 15 minutes or more um, for a specified period of time. And once we get the whole list of contacts, then my job, well, my team's job is to call everybody and uh, discuss different things. So um, I'll call my con contact number one 
and tell them, you know, ask them if they're aware that they've been exposed to somebody with coronavirus. And they usually have been told, so that makes my job much easier. We're not allowed to tell them who the person is. So then I go down a list of symptoms and ask them if they have any of them. And for this example, I'm, we're just going to pretend that they're not infectious at all. And I mean, sorry, not that they're not infectious, that they don't have any of the symptoms. And uh, then we talk about, we tell them that they need to monitor themselves for their quarantine period. And their quarantine period is going to be at least 14 days from the last time they saw the case. And uh, if they actually live in a house with the case, it's actually going to be longer than that. So um, we ask if this is going to cause, so the monitoring is asking people to take their temperature twice a day and just to keep an eye on their symptoms. And um, they may be called every day by the public health department or they may just be monitored by, they, they can self-monitor by sending in an email and telling us if they have any symptoms or not. Um, so let's, and the other thing is we, we talk about quarantining and we ask if that's going to be a problem. Can they work from home? Is it going to be a problem for them to get food? We want them to stay in their house. So do they have a dog who needs to be walked? And we try and help them think through any scenarios that, that may be an issue during that period of time. We might suggest that, you know, maybe their neighbor or a friend or relative can get them groceries and drop them at the drop them in front of the front door and, um, and go away and then they won't be exposing them just in case they're infectious. So let's just take this into the dance scenario. Um, John goes to a dance, he's feeling just fine and he dances with all his partners and as Amy pointed out, everybody else in the room basically. And the next day, he's not feeling so great, so he goes to the doctor, he ends up getting tested for COVID, and his test comes back positive. So um, when we get in touch with John, we're going to say, who are your contacts during, you know, oh, so what did you do the day before you started feeling sick? Oh, I went to a contra dance. Oh, can you tell me, you know, who you might have contacted there? Well, there's a long list of people there, but you may not know all those people. I know I danced with John, but John doesn't know my last name, or maybe he does, but he probably doesn't have my phone number. Because when we do talk to the case, we're asking for, um, I forgot about this, um, all the contact, we, we need to know how we're going to get in touch with all those contacts. So hopefully we have at least an, a phone number or a um, or at least uh, maybe a supervisor at work, somehow that we can, we can proceed and, and get in touch with them. So one thing that restaurants and bars have started doing, the ones that are opening back up, is they are collecting um, people's first and last name and phone numbers and uh, email addresses sometimes, just in case there's a situation where there's someone who's positive, who turns up positive for their um, for the coronavirus and then they can get back to say you're sitting at a table and uh, that weight person became positive then they then the restaurant can contact you and and tell you that you were possibly exposed to somebody and and you can quarantine appropriately um, there are a lot of issues with privacy. We, you know, I, we call sometimes and people don't want to talk to us because they think we're, we're trying to get money out of them. And um, we can prove that we're calling from the health department, but that isn't always good enough for people. And people don't want to share their private information. Um, you know, there are a lot of phishing scams out there. So as a dancer, as a singer, are you going to be willing to share your information so that in case someone is positive, you can be contacted so that you can make, do the, I want to say the right thing by staying home and not, and possibly not infecting someone else. People can be infectious for up to 14 days and that's a really long time. That's why we have a quarantine period for as long as it is. Um, 
So, so this is just one of the many things to think about in terms of reopening. And I miss dancing so much. I, I would love to be dancing, but it is just not time to even think about it. Even if we were all wearing masks, yeah. I, I, it just, it's just not time yet. Thank so, you. Uh, I think we, if you have a, a, few, a few closing remarks, what's the take home message you wanted to give today, Michael? Um, think about whether or not you're willing to share your, your privacy, your, your information with people. And, um, and, uh, I'm on board with a vaccine for a vaccine as soon as possible. And, and I had a question that came up just before we move on, um, as a contact tracer, would you be, uh, how would you feel about hearing that someone you have to contact had just been to a contra dance? How would that would that how would that impact your work? It it would really hit home. And, but but I have to say that right now, if I heard that somebody had gone to a contra dance, I would also feel really mad because I feel like someone should not be. I think it's very irresponsible to be holding a dance right now. I think that that's very inappropriate. And, and people don't think about the repercussions. I mean, it's very easy to say, um, well, if you don't want to take the chance, don't come. But I think sometimes people don't realize that they can be there and bring it home to people who might be immunocompromised or, you know, even a stranger on the street, if you end up next to them for too long and you cough or something, that's going to have, a cough has a lot of particles in it. So I really, I would, I would feel really not happy about hearing that there had been a contra dance. Great. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that perspective. Um, and thank you for the work that you're doing as a contract tracer. All right. Next up, we have Owen Morrison. Owen, as I think many of you know, is a professional freelance musician who depends a lot on our sector for income. And uh, I asked him to share his perspective on uh, from, from, a, from a musician's perspective on what he would advise. Hi, uh, my name's Owen Morrison. I'm a full-time musician. And I just wanted to give you a sense of um, what, what my first two months of the year were like. Um, I started the year in Berea, Kentucky at Christmas Country Dance School. And that's a place where 300 to 400 people uh, dance and sing and do the things we love to do all for a week long. Then I spent a weekend in California, a weekend in Boston, a weekend in Seattle, a weekend in New York, and another weekend traveling around New England. And all of that I was going home and, and back and playing local gigs in my, in my home of Washington, D.C. as well. So every one of those situations, there were from 100 to 400 people in a big room. And uh, of course, you know what they're doing. They're all touching each other. They're exerting themselves, they're breathing, breathing, breathing heavily into each other's faces. Um, it's an extended period of time. We're all there for hours, and it's really fun. Um, I'm pretty lucky that I didn't contract it, I think, um, during those first two months, because I was in a lot of hot spots early on when we didn't even know it was around uh, January and February. Uh, so that's to say, that's just like the, the worst thing you could possibly do. I'm traveling from place to place, and a lot of the other people that are there have been traveling uh, to get there as well. So, uh, and then you're in this space that, that it sounds like from what Amy said, uh, is, is a really clear way to pass the virus on. So that's just impossible for me. I mean, I can't do that. And, and I don't think anyone can, uh, some people have asked about local things. Like what if you just take the travel out of the picture, can we do something if it's, if it's just within a, a local area where there's not that much transmission of the virus, there haven't been that, that many cases or they've gone down a lot. Um, and for me, the answer is easy, that it's just no, um, based on what Michael just said, uh, it's just such a, it's such a high risk activity that um, I can't do that for myself. The, my main priority is keeping myself and my family and the very few people that I'm in physical contact with safe. And in our little bubble, we're all responsible for each other and we all are counting on each other not to do anything that's high risk. So with that said, um, I want to talk about the impact on this whole thing to freelancers. Um, there's an emotional impact 
pretty much to everyone on this call and everyone in the world, really. Uh, and for me, a, a big part of it is losing my, this my identity as being a musician is, is what, what I am and what I do. And I have found that it's really helpful to play, carve out as much time, even though I can't play with other people and do it the way I normally do, to carve out time to really practice, to do online lessons have been great. Um, and to compose as much as I can. And I think we can all find some way to do these things that we love, either remotely with other people or, or find ways to do them individually. And it actually has helped me a lot in that way. From a financial perspective, it's really hard on freelancers and many, many other people. Um, uh, currently, there's the, the um, unemployment from the federal government has helped a lot of my colleagues, I know. Um, and so many of them are doing as well and some even better than, than they were doing before financially. But that does run out um, at the end of this month. There's only about three more weeks of that. And we have no idea what will happen with Congress and whether they'll choose to support gig workers and uh, other people have, have become unemployed. So um, let's get on to things that we can do to help. Um, if in that case, we can ask the government to, to um, really look at the arts and uh, all unemployed people, really. And there's CDSS has flagged uh, an organization, artsactionfund.org. You can go there and compose a letter to Congress about um, extending some of the, the very necessary assistance going to people who have lost their livelihoods from, from this. Um, other ways, if you're an organizer, you can, um, let's see, you can hold online events, you can ask, if you've had to cancel events, you can ask some of your registrants to uh, donate a portion of their registration to, to help those that would have been paid from that event. Or if you have regular events, you can um, have, hold, have online events that actually bring a community together and, and let people engage with each other, but also let that be a small fundraising for the people that normally uh, are relying on, on the financial aspect of this. If you're an individual, um, there's so many things going on. There's online concerts, there's people are selling their wares in all sorts of ways, and you can participate as much as you can if you're able. Um, I would also encourage people to look for those people who are not so visibly unemployed. If you spend your career on stage, uh, you kind of already have a built-in fan base and those people are willing to assist. And there's a lot of people out there that don't have that as well. So look for the people that are more invisible. Um, and be creative. Uh, I've commissioned art from a friend, an artist friend, and other people have commissioned me to write music, write tunes for them. Uh, online lessons are great, musical lessons. If you want to learn an instrument, you can find someone who could really use the uh, the income and has a lot to give you. Also, uh, not just music lessons, but if you want to learn a new language or anything else you'd like to do, tutoring is such a great thing to do online. So think about all the ways that um, you can help those in need if, if, you, if it's possible for you. And I think I'll just leave it at that. Perfect timing. What a musician you are. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. Um, Next, we have uh, Donna Hunt. So now we'll hear a little bit from the perspective of a uh, dance organizer who's been reaching out to other organizers in a kind of larger region to start having these conversations and work together um, to discuss what, what's safe and when. So Donna Hunt, please take it away. Hi, um, I'm a member of the Mount Airy Contra Dance in Philadelphia, and I'm, um, I started a group of dance organizers in my area, and we call it Safe to Dance Again with a question mark. Um, and just here's, an, here's how it started. So Friday, March 6th, it was important to note that there were only two COVID cases in all of Pennsylvania. On Sunday the 8th, there was a positive COVID case in a doctor's office one mile from my house. On the 9th, on Monday, there were 10 COVID cases in Pennsylvania, and the news reported that a local doctor in a hospital nearby was infecting patients because he was asymptomatic at the time. 
I only live 15 minutes from my local contradance, so all of these infections were very close. In an abundance of caution, the Mount Airy contradance made the difficult decision to cancel our Thursday dance on the 12th, which featured a popular band from Seattle, Washington, which, which you probably remember was the hot spot where much of this started. On Friday the 13th, the Pennsylvania governor canceled all schools. On Tuesday, March 17th, there were 96 cases in Pennsylvania and 50% of those were right around where I live. Um, so in 10 days, Pennsylvania went from two cases to 96. In mid-April, the governors in Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey announced that they were going to work together with the governors from surrounding states to fight COVID-19 and, more importantly, create a structured plan for reopening. And that got me thinking. Our Philadelphia dance community regularly welcomes dancers from an hour and a half to two hours away. And if we held just one dance, we could infect dancers from eight or more different dance communities in three or four states. That was a scary thought. So I reached out to dance organizers in New Jersey, Delaware, um, Pennsylvania as you know, far west as Harrisburg, north to the Poconos and State College, and started this Safe to Dance Again group. We have 53 organizers on the list representing 23 different dance groups. There are representatives from Contra, English, mostly waltz, Scottish, international folk, and Zydeco. Through email, we've shared articles, videos, statistics, and theories. We've gathered in, on Zoom conference call in early June, and after sharing personal stories and concerns about the vulnerable dancers in our communities, we all agreed that it was way too soon to even consider dancing again, but we agreed to Zoom again in August. And I expect that we'll keep the group open until it truly is safe to dance. So if you're interested in gathering dance organizers from your geographic area, there are resources for you to use. And if I could have the next slide, please. CDSS has a group directory and um, there's the website for that. You could also tap into Jeff Kaufman's tricontra.com. It's a website and you put your zip code in and it gives you all the dances in your nearby area. Um, also, uh, talk with other dancers and um, organizers and learn what other dance forms are in your area, English, Scottish, ballroom, Scandi, international. And encourage any of your participants to invite the dance organizers that they know to join the group so that you cast a wide net. I use Google Groups and Google Docs to share information and I encouraged all the group participants to send the information through the Google Group so that it was archived and accessible. And I shared a number of the group's resources. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so these are the ones that came through our group that were particularly appropriate. Um, when epidemiologists expect to fly, hug, and 18 other everyday activities. And there was a fitness dance class in South Korea that spread COVID. And the third one is a 3D simulation that shows why social distancing is so important. And that was um, our first speaker spoke about the droplets and how things are spread. So this was really, um, it was a great simulation. And next slide, please. So this video, um, the moderator is a Johns Hopkins medical doctor, as well as an international teacher in swing dance and Lindy Hop. So the first half of that video um, is all about COVID and the second half talks about the risks and that might be associated with dance and what you might be able to do about that. And then the third one, uh, the final one is the risks, know them and avoid them, just kind of a a good overall in information. So if you have further questions, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to share information or talk more about our group. And thanks to CDSS for hosting this web chat. Some important information going out there. Great. Well, you're very welcome. And thank you, Donna. Um, for those of you who don't have the chat bar open, Sarah is putting all of the links that Donna 
our friend Brenna's done a slide in the chat bar, and we will also add them to resources on uh, in the CDSS page too. Um, great, thank you. So we are also, next we're gonna hear, um, we have two more, um, well, three more guests, but two are going together. Um, Bill and Sarah, Bill Quirin and Sarah Gowen, Gowen. I'm, she's lovely, however I say it. Um, they're from Drexel, Pennsylvania, and they organize um, some musicians, community music. So we'll hear from uh, some of their thoughts and perspective on that. After that, uh, we'll hear from Will Qualley, who is a song organizer, um, figuring out ways for people to get together and continue singing uh, in, from Montague, Mass. So Bill and Sarah, take it away. Hello. Hi, so it is Sarah Gowan. And uh, before we go anywhere, we wanted to say that when we first, um, uh, this first started, our band Cora Cree had started a tour. And uh, as we headed south, the coronavirus was kind of creeping ahead of us. So we immediately renamed our band Corona Cree and headed back home. <laughs> so <laughs> where we've been ever since. Yeah. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about how we're connecting with our musicians community here. Um, Bill and our friend Kim Neubauer are co-coordinators uh, co of our open band that we call Spuds in the, at the Mount Airy Contra Dance. And uh, we have, what, about 25 to 30 people who usually come? Who show up. Yeah, we have about 150 people on our list. Right. And uh, we have a Zoom tune swap. We do it every other week. Right. So we decided to stay connected with people. What people were really missing were jams. And, of course, that's pretty much impossible with the technology at this point. Um, so we, we've set up some online tune swap yeah. uh, to kind of help people connect. It's, we found that one of the ways that we've made it really successful is to make it a social hour as much as anything and set the expectations for what's gonna happen and what people are gonna get out of it super low. Like you're not gonna get a big immersion into a tune the way you would if you're sitting there with 30 people. Um, but you can take a minute to see people's faces and uh, play a few tunes and maybe learn some new tunes. Yeah, we have a different theme every, uh, every meeting. And um, <clears throat> uh, some of the themes are like, uh, like your favorite tune, and then there's a new tune, and then there is your favorite couple dance tune. And um, we encourage people to kind of uh, connect by maybe sending them the, the uh, backup of a tune. Send that to them in in some sort of form, and that person will play it at the Zoom meeting. You know, you can't play at the same time in a Zoom meeting because one uh, uh, account will cancel out the other. And that also happens for contras, uh, uh, the Zoom contras, and. Um, are we ready to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I want to go back to one of the, the things that's making our um, particular open band. Uh, virtual meetings really successful is that um, we send out sheet music. So we'll, Bill and I will pick out eight to ten tunes or people will send us suggestions. We'll send them this, the sheet music for it through a PDF file. So it kind of accommodates all of the people we have in our group who are readers and um, it helps people to learn new tunes, but yeah. they still get to hear it when we play. Yeah. We also got um, three new people uh, joining our, our uh, open band just on uh, Zoom, right. which is kind of nice. <laughs> All right, Contras? Yeah, Contras. Yeah, so Contras, we've been having uh, Contra dances in uh, Philadelphia on Zoom, which uh, are surprisingly fun. <laughs> and we've played for a couple of them. Um, and Donna, who just spoke, uh, is one of the organizers of the, of the Zoom dance. And um, uh, just a quick description of how it happens is that we use another platform so we're all on Zoom, but the musicians, if the musicians and caller did something at the same time on Zoom, they would cancel each other out. Like you wouldn't hear it when the caller spoke, you wouldn't hear the music and, and the other way around. So uh, what we do is the music and the, and the caller go to another platform called Source Connect Now, and we um, share our audio and um, uh, we're, we're muted on Zoom, 
and the caller is not muted on Zoom, and they share this other platform. They share their computer audio. And then suddenly you get music and calling at happening at the same time. It was, it was really important to us to continue the tradition of live music. This could all be done by a caller with recorded music, but keeping people involved and connected meant to us having the tradition of live music for these, these online things. I think before we run out of time, one of the things we should talk about, though, is that people are wanting to get together in person. And as things start opening up in Pennsylvania, um, people are getting the urge to connect. It's nice weather outside. And so some in-person jams are being organized. Um, I personally have really mixed feelings about it. I, we've been to a couple. The ones I've felt really comfortable at have been five or six people at the most, spread out very far, outdoors, everyone wearing masks. Yeah. I went to another one where we had more like 10 people, and I looked up at one point, and Bill and I were the only ones wearing masks at that point, and I had to go home. I couldn't, mm -hmm. couldn't do it. So I think the thing about organizing jams is that people need to be super aware of what protocols are working. Um, wh what people are understanding about the virus, which um, our guest talked about earlier. And then they have to be s really, really, really great about communication, what each person feels comfortable with, what they don't, what they expect of somebody hosting a jam like that, um, and really being uh, respectful of what everyone's needs are uh, medically and uh, what individuals' risk um, levels the risk comfort levels are. We did one other thing that was, um, I'm almost done. Uh, we, we had four people in our house, but we had two people, the other two people in different rooms. Right. And so we had four people playing at one time for a contra dance, which was kind of terrific. So again, that was another way, and everybody had masks on, so we could, but we could spread them out and keep them isolated. Yeah. So there's, there are some really great creative solutions for how to play music together, how to keep your community together. I don't, did, did the, the slide make it with the uh, Zoom sketches? Linda, I don't know if that made it. One of, one of the great things about our, our Zoom uh, contras is, or the Zoom uh, tune swaps has been our, uh, one of our artists, uh, members of SPUDS, has been sketching everybody during the, um, during the session and at the end he'll hold up drawings of each person and so I've started collecting them onto a, a web page which I can post a link to later, um, there, with all these wonderful sketches of people playing in the moment. And, and that's been a real uplifting thing for us. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Thank you both so much for sharing what you're doing. Um, definitely, uh, I, I hope that, um, are you open to people reaching out to, to ask questions and talk through things? Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um, and their personal website is boxandstringmusic.com. Uh, uh, all right, so our final guest is Will Qualley. Will is from Montague, Massachusetts. And I do wanna say, um, a lot of times on these web chats, we really work to get geographic spread and representation. Um, it was harder this time, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of people we reached out to um, didn't, uh, weren't available. Um, but we're really, really uh, pleased with what um, what is being shared. So I hope that um, I hope that feelings of uh, us not getting enough geographic representation are are not too distracting. Um, and thank you for those who are reaching out and messaging me about that. But let's put that aside and listen to the cool things that Will Qualley is making happen in Montague, Mass. Hi, thanks, Katie. I'm Will. I'm a longtime singer in pubs and folk clubs and camp weeks. I'm also an ethnomusicologist and a research librarian and a former public policy writer. I'm not an expert in virus transmission or a doctor like some of our guests, but I've read an awful lot about this in my role as a co-organizer of a daily sing in my village that's been running 113 days in a row that didn't exist pre-COVID. We've worked together to discuss, develop, implement, and revisit best practices by following the evolving scientific understanding and by our local changing environment. I've learned a lot as a song organizer. Uh, it's an unusual situation starting something from scratch, largely shaped by a public health crisis, but hopefully what we've learned might be able to help you do something. I'll go quickly through some recommended reading and I'll note that this entire script 
and an expanded version of it. And all the links are at towncommonsongs.org. There's a link in the upper right to CDSS Talk. You'll find that here. The key takeaway, don't think about this as re-entry. Think about this as an opportunity to start something completely new. It won't be what you're used to. It won't be what you expect, but it can be really fulfilling and safe if you go about it carefully. So I wanna give you caution and inspiration and a lot of resources. I don't recommend restarting your existing event, song swap, pub session, folk choir, shape note, whatever it is, it probably is too large for this model to work. You're probably too spread out across multiple towns or urban neighborhoods traveling some distance for a weekly or monthly entire evening long activity. Not to mention, you probably meet indoors in a pub, community hall, or church, and none of those spaces, none, are adequately ventilated for singing. Moreover, you'll be shuffling around, moving past each other on your way to the bar or the toilets. This is the recipe for a perfect storm disaster, like you may have heard about with the Seattle choir practice back in March, where 53 attendees got infected as one of the early super spreader events. Lots of stuff that we learned from that tragedy and fortunately can take away from that. We now understand aerosols, as we heard earlier, to be the most, one of the most significant transmission vectors. There's been a lot about that this week. Links to everything here, again, is online. So I'm just gonna blitz through and say that there was a great open letter by 239 scientists pushing back against the World Health Organization, emphasizing the aerosol situation. That's now online, it's pretty readable. There are a lot of New York Times articles discussing that and other things, discussing what's been happening with transmission in churches, problematic in the last two weeks, versus what's been happening at protests, surprisingly few cases that have been documented uh, from that. Being outdoors is very effective compared to being indoors at reducing the aerosol risk. So are other things. Specific to singing, there's a great article in the Journal of Voice published on July 1st. A lot of this stuff is very current. Um, it's a tremendous literature review from Harvard Medical School. It's the best thing you can read right now. Some of the takeaways, sing outdoors, wear masks, keep your group small, well distanced, keep your sing shorter than you're used to, limit extraneous activities, and obviously if you think you're remotely possibly sick, stay home. So, who are we? I recommend you think about this as a who are the people in your neighborhood sing rather than as a shanty sing or as whatever specific genre you're used to. You'll find you have teachers, choir members, hospice volunteers, shape note leaders, summer camp alumni and parents, Gilbert and Sullivan enthusiasts, folks who know all the Pete Seeger and Sweet Honey and the Rock songs, maybe even a Morris dancer. You'll meet people and collectively you'll form something new and as a group what you sing is what you are. Most days we're five to nine people, sometimes just two, occasionally 10, maybe 12. We've had about 40 different singers show up across the past four months. Two pretty reliably every day, several, more than half the time, and a lot of people regularly but less often or only occasionally. We sing at 2 p.m. every day for about an hour, form a circle, 10 to 12 feet between adjacent people, 20 to 40 feet across the ring. Anyone can lead a song, Briefly teaching, we've developed a repertoire of over 400 songs at this point in all different genres and everyone's found new favorites. What we sing varies with the number of singers, the size of the ring, the amount of traffic on the road, the amount of rain or snow or hail. Some days we can only sing call and response or shanties, other days rounds and tight harmonies. We sing for about an hour and know that we'll be there again tomorrow. So most days that's fine. Everyone knows at least two of us are gonna be there. So people show up, which is great. It helps a dozen of us live with a, in a five minute walk or cycle from the common and almost everyone else is only a five minute drive. That's what I mean when I say local. Don't travel. The first thing we did when we publicized this was encourage people not to come, but to try to follow our model wherever they live. If you've never organized a sing, this is your opportunity. We've got a resource for you. It starts with CDSS's resource about how to organize a sing, but it updates that to talk about outdoor spaces, frequency, duration, attendance, and balancing inclusivity and protecting your safety and others, which are all new concerns and super important for anything you might try to do. How did we arrive at our practices? 
The key point is they're always changing, informed by circumstances and research. Lots of discussions, how to protect our safety while maintaining community. We talk between songs, we share articles over email, we check in with each other by text message. Even, hey, I didn't see it. Oh yeah, I was you know, doing, taking a walk or something. I've never been in a singing community which was so proactive and inclusive about communications and that also is key. So as a case study, why aren't we wearing masks in the picture that you see there? Many factors went into that decision and it's a current decision. We may revisit it. We're blessed with really good fortune geographically with four cases in our entire town in the last two months, less than one per day across our county in the past month. We sing in an extremely rural open air space. Aerosols disperse faster outdoors and they disperse faster in rural air than in uh, polluted air. We're hyper local and we really emphasize distance. Would masks make us safer? Yes, but so would not singing at all. We've looked at risk factors, assessed risk as individuals, talked about it as a community and collectively decided for now, this works. We found with masks in our outdoor location, maintaining a 20 to 40 foot circle, we could sing as individuals, but we couldn't stay together. We lost the ability to hear people. We lost the ability to stay together, work against the environmental noise, read mouths often as a cue. And we felt we were losing the community aspect that was most important. So we emphasized distance, doubled down on that, and just keep focus on things so that if anything changes, we revisit decisions like that. But for now, that's the trade-off that's working for us. And it's something we keep talking about. Whatever you do should be different than whatever we're doing, but have these types of conversations and keep up to date. One place you can keep up to date is our website. We've got a ton of resources that we've put together in hopes that other people might try to do something like this. Mm -hmm. um, so I strongly recommend don't try to get your existing pub sing, folk chorale, or regular event going again. Not, not for a while, probably not this year. Um, instead of re-entry, think about whether you can start something totally new. Outdoors, ideally fewer than 10 singers, extremely local, inclusive, shorter, but more frequent than you're used to, and inclusive in a way that mostly includes very local people, but not your friends, from the next town over or certainly right. further afield. Right. So you can contact me for more information if you want through the website, check it out. I hope that in addition to science and caution and guidelines, you'll take some inspiration from seeing what we sing and hearing us sing and might become a safe sing organizer in your community. Great. Will, thank you so much for sharing that. That is really, it looks wonderful. Um, and uh, <laughs> we did have someone ask, is this risky? Is, for CDSS to be sharing this. Um, the, the scenario that Will describes is well within the understood guidelines of what is safe behavior as we know it now, but I, I really wanna emphasize that this is, the more we learn about the virus, we will need to keep revising our, what we consider safe over and over and over again. And I think one thing that um, really wanna to emphasize too is that the social distance protocols that we have in place now, the masks, the hand washing, the six feet distance, all that stuff, that is to prevent transmission or reduce transmission in a, in a low um, duration scenario. Um, when you move inside and you have closed ventilation systems or you are in close proximity, like six feet or so, two people for a prolonged period of time, hours at a time, those protocols are no longer as effective in preventing transmission. And that's something that I think really as organizers, uh, any sort of organizers, the whole arts community is coming to terms with right now is that social distance protocols while reducing transmission in limited duration scenarios, they don't work that same way. So it's not a simple case of just taking those protocols and moving inside and feeling secure. Um, so that's wonderful. Thank you all so much. I do wanna, um, say there are a few take-home messages I hope that you're hearing. Um, based on what we know right now, it's really not going to be safe to come back together like we used to for a good while. And I know the big question on everyone's minds are, okay, fine, when and how? Um, what I'm saying is we have time to work on that. We are researching uh, 
some of the phase reentry plans from other arts organizations. The board is looking and sending me stuff on a daily basis, members and community members. So we are working on developing some guidelines. But the message I hope you leave here with is that right now, what we need to be doing is focusing on keeping people together and preparing for a joyous reunion. Um, about a century ago, after the last big pandemic, there was a surge in interest in social dance afterwards. And I, I really believe that will be the true after this pandemic. Um, so instead of spinning our wheels on, are we gonna come back together in December? Well, how about January? Well, how about February? Well, when exactly? We need to, we need to grieve that. We need to let it go. And we need to spend our energy creating new ways for people to connect during this time and preparing for welcoming people in after the pandemic. Um, so that means, that really basically means that the job description, the, the job description of a dance music and song organizer is just now dramatically different. Um, and I think you all know that. We all know that. That's true for so many of us right now. But instead of organizing events and lining up talent, now the job description is, this is how we, to take care of your community. What you need to do is actively seek out information on COVID-19 as it's emerging. To participate in as many of these conversations on this level or regionally as you possibly can to keep sharing and understanding information, monitoring the guidelines that are in place in your, where you live. Keep engaging your community in new and different ways. There are so many folks right now who are really isolated, who really depended on their dance music and song communities as a major uh, part of how they socialize and connect with people. So we can't dance, but we can reach out and we can pick up the phone and we can create quirky, awkward times for us to be together and laugh at how awkward they are. And but we've got to keep at it. And um, and most of all, I hope that we can start talking about using this time to do some of the work that always gets pushed aside or that could really um, could really prepare us for a wave of new interest when we do go back to dancing and singing and playing music as normal. So on that note, um, we, we at CDSS are trying very hard to keep up with um, sharing resources and bits of information. Uh, the more you, our com larger community members, uh, friends share with us, the more we can put out there. Linda's gonna talk through some of the resources that we do have available right now. Um, so Linda Henry, take it away. I don't know if I'm visible or not. Can people see me? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to run through this very quickly because we're running late. Um, please take a look at this list and know that there are many resources available through CDSS and you can be in touch with us at any time. First of all, I want to be sure you know about the CDSS resource portal that's full of uh, information for organizers on many, many pertinent topics. We have quarterly e-blasts for organizers called Shop Talk. You can sign up for that. This web chat series, of course, and on our website, you can see the recordings and materials from all of our previous web chats. We have the community outreach grants, and those have previously been mostly for in-person events, and at this time, we're offering funding for online workshops, um, anti-racism workshops, etc. So if you're cooking up a project and need some funding, you can let us know. We also have the quarterly e-blast for our affiliates. If you are not an affiliate, we strongly encourage you to check out our information on the website. And we have weekly, I mean, quarterly newsletters, and those often include articles that would be pertinent for organizers. Next slide. Nikki? Go ahead. Oh, there, we are. oh, there we are. Okay. And on our home page, we encourage you to check out the COVID related resources that are right there. Um, out of our last web chat grew a new resource for organizers where you can either post an event, a type of event or idea from your community or see what other communities are doing to keep their groups engaged. 
And we also have online events calendar and event cancellation calendars. You're welcome to submit your events. And uh, we have a way to, for any people who can, contribute to our freelancers and all artists are welcome to in, uh, add their information to the website. Next slide. So to follow up, tomorrow morning you'll be receiving a very important survey from me and we welcome your input. All of the valuable feedback that we get are helping us continue and improve these web chats and it's a way that you can let us know what topics you would like to request for future web chats. So the recording and PowerPoint and chat bar transcription from this web chat will be available on our website early next week and we encourage you to please keep in touch with us. Think of me, Linda Henry, as a person you can talk to anytime about the challenges your community is encountering, the successes you're having, any, any way that we can understand your needs and even be creating additional resources would be wonderful. So please be in touch with me anytime. I'd be happy to talk with you by phone or there's my email right there, resources at cdss.org. We really appreciate all the hard work that you're each doing and we are here for you. So keep us, keep us in touch. Great. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much. Um, yep, all of those, all of our resources are stronger the more you send to us. So if you come across something, um, keep us in mind and send it our way so we can share it out. Um, I wanted to, to give uh, a follow-up on my encouragement to stay engaged. Um, BACDSS and Claire Takamori have been doing some really great mass engagement opportunities, the Toronto English Country Dance as well. There's so many that I can't keep up with them now. Um, there's also going to be another online, dis uh, online discussion about this uh, flurry, uh, the dance festival or the large festival in New York uh, that happens in February. Um, they are facilitating a conversation in August. So if you've ever been to that or if you want to keep track of their website, that's another great opportunity to just check in and see if our understanding of everything is, um, is evolving. So. A quick time check. Um, we are going to go after nine o'clock if we stay on schedule. I think we still need to, to, to keep going and so you're welcome to uh, stick around. We're going to shorten the Q&A portion to 20 to 15 minutes and then the breakout sessions uh, to 10 or did I get that backwards? Anyway, we'll do our best we can. So now's the time if you haven't already submitted your questions or maybe if they're old, submit them again in the chat bar. Um, and we will have some facilitated discussions. Uh, Owen Mor Morrison, uh, oh yeah, you're here. I'm sorry, I misread your text. I thought you said you had to leave, but that's not true. Oh, here. Hi, okay. So, um, great. Sarah, I believe you are the one who uh, is monitoring the questions. You're muted. <laughs> Oh, we're having some technical difficulties here. Um, um, there, there we go. Yep. Nikki, we can actually, I think, turn the slides off for right now, just so we can see the whole panel. Um, great. So um, we're going to do our best to pull questions from the chat. Um, let's see. Is is there a particular type of face mask that may be better for singers? Does anybody from the panel want to take that one? Will, maybe, or um, Amy? I don't know the answer to that. Um, what I can say is that everyone in our community who has a face mask has one that they made themselves or that a friend in the folk community made. So these are various things following patterns that are, you know, good DIY masks, but not, I don't know that anyone has tried singing in an N95, for instance, or a respirator or a surgical mask. Um, so I don't really know. 
what the answer is, but these are things that, that we may continue to experiment with. Great. Um, some folks in the chat are suggesting plastic face shields instead of a close-up mask might be a good alternative. Um, Amy, I don't know if you have a take on that in terms of effectiveness of plastic face shields versus masks. Amy's still with us. Um, all right, let's see. Other questions. Um, if you have been contact traced and you get a negative test, are you free of the 14-day quarantine? Michael, this one's for you, I think. Sorry, I had to unmute again. Um, yeah. If you get it, it's a complicated um it's a complicated formula because it, it depends on a lot of things it has to be within a certain time period it depends if you're a household contact or a non-household contact i actually brought this because usually people haven't um had that yet so um, you still, you have to have two consecutive negative tests within 24 hours and they need to be at least 24 hours apart and you would have never, it, you know, it also depends if you've been asymptomatic or not. That's if you're asymptomatic, but, um, you know, we all, most people don't have that kind of access to tests. So in general, I would say no. Thank you. Um, here's a question. Um, what do you think of outdoor gatherings to stay connected, at least while the weather is good, um, an event in the park or parking lot with relatively small dance communities? Um, this could be for anybody on the panel. So um, outdoor gatherings, what's the take? Outdoor is always better than indoor. <laughs> yeah, I'd say outdoors, the aerosol problem is not as great. The aerosol thing is really the big problem indoors in places that aren't well ventilated. Um, but you still have the problem of being close to each other and you still have the respiratory droplets within six feet. Right. Um, you have to wear masks, sure. <laughs> yeah. Here's a question about... Um, it's a, a given that uh, we'll lose some dancers when we come back um, who won't return to dancing, but how can we reach out now and gather people who won't, don't go back to whatever else they were doing and invite them to come dance with us when we are able to dance again? Um, this might, I don't know if Katie, if you have a thought about this, about reaching out to folks who might not be dancers or people who are not dancing now, how do we keep them engaged so that they will come back when we do start dancing again? Um, I've certainly heard from a lot of people that uh, mobility is a concern mm -hmm. or maintaining mobility while we're not dancing regularly. So one thing that everybody uh, that we can do in our dance communities is share and really encourage them to, to, to participate in some of the events, online events of um, single dancing or, or moving around. Um, just to keep everybody's joints nice and limber. Um, and I think that's, that's also an opportunity for folks to feel con connected to the larger community, the larger scene in the country. Um, and I do also think that it's, uh, well, when Will was talking about who all was coming to his sings, that it's not necessarily the people that were already involved. Um, my first thought was, oh, what a great recruitment device, you know, just the idea that this is actually in doing, doing hyper local special things for the community, you can kind of shift the feel of what we do from like a club of people who get together because of the activity and more the activity as an expression of community support and joy. And that's something that I think could be really powerful and an opportunity to um, maybe do some recruitment before we can even get back together. So Katie, I'd like to also address that question 
mm -hmm. um, in Mount, it's Donna Hunt, at Mount Airy Contra Dance, um, twice a month we have Zoom Contra Dances, which Bill uh, Corrin spoke about, but also twice a month we have socials. Um, and we get a different host each, each time we have a social and they pick a topic. So if it's two truths and a lie, or would you rather this or this, it's just something to stimulate conversation and we break people into small groups and they get a chance to chat in a small group and then we bring them back. And, you know, so we do that for an hour. And um, Bill and Sarah are also doing the jams, which they spoke about. So on our social nights, they do the jam from seven to eight, which allows the musicians to come to the social from eight to nine. And that's just another way that we've been doing this. We, we've actually had a couple of people who were musicians who didn't know anything about contra dancing who've come and wanted to play a few tunes and then checked out the, the contra dancing afterwards. So that's another avenue. That's great. I do see, I saw a comment on the side that said, uh, Judy Keller has been producing weekly newsletters and making eight calls a week to those that she knows are, are alone or isolated. Um, yeah, and so if you come together as an organizing team or a group of friends and just kind of talk about who to reach out to, that can be a, not a very long, burdensome task and can make a huge difference. Great. Um, next question. Uh, we've heard there are phone apps for contact tracing in China. Is there any contact app being rolled out in the U.S.? Does anybody know the answer to that? I, I think people are discussing it, but, you know, there's a big privacy issue, and um, everybody would have to have it. And we all don't have the same type of phone. Not everybody has a phone. So, um, I, I mean, for now, I don't think that's really feasible. Um, here's another take on the um, Zoom Contra idea. Once we are able to dance together again in person safely, do you think we'll still keep the online dances happening as well? And there's some conversation happening about that in chat, so I'd be interested to hear the panelists' take on it as well. God, I hope not. <laughs> it's kind of not what we want to do, none of us. Um, the, I th maybe Zoom social hours, but I would hope not dancing <laughs> I will second that I'd yeah. want to say for people I, I will say it's fun to pop into Toronto or over to the Bay Area to do a zoom contra dance and see friends from there but no if I have a, a chance to be in person with my community that there's just no comparison yeah there there are quite a few comments in the chat um, about the advantages of zoom um, gatherings, and I do think it's, as an accessibility uh, point, it, it is really great that lots of people can ex access this, even if they can't make to a, a in-person dance, but there seems to be a strong preference for in-person gatherings when we are able. Um, how much time do we have, Katie? Um, let's, let's do one more. I know there are so many questions, and I'm so sorry to cut it short, but I, I really want to give folks time to have just small group discussion. So let's do one more question. Um, and then remember, if you have burning questions and want to continue this conversation, um, you're always welcome to shift the conversation over to Shared Weight, which is an email listserv uh, organized by topic. So if you want to talk about song organizing, you can continue there, or dance organizing there. Okay, Great. so let's do one more question. Um, okay, let me see if I can find one. Um, this is, again, is there any safe distance currently for a uh, safe distance, if any, for a short amount of gentle dancing or moving to music outdoors? Or is it really not worth, um, like, I think the question is, can you dance if you're separated by six feet, like moving in synchronicity as long as you're not touching? Is there any safe distance that you can dance to music or just don't risk it at all? And this is specified for an outdoor yeah. gathering. I'll take that one. Um, yeah. So, you know, which people talk about what is safe and what's not safe. And I think we have to all realize that we all have a different idea of what is safe. You know, it, I mean, everything we do has some risk to it. You know, getting in the car has risk to it. Um, so, and if you're, so when time you're coming into contact with people, there is some risk, but the amount of risk increases the closer you get and indoors or not. So you have to kind of think about like where on the spectrum of, of risk it is and how much everyone is comfortable with, as I'd say. Great. 
Thank you. All right. Okay. Great questions, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Actually, I've, this, the chat is simultaneously wonderful and very distracting. And um, But thank you so much for, uh, there's so much we will follow up on uh, from our perspective. So final section, we want to move into breakout rooms. So if you pre-registered, you gave some information and Crispin, why don't you tell us how this is going to go? Sure, thanks Katie. So hi everyone. Um, my name's Crispin, I'm the CDSS office manager. Um, we're now gonna move you into breakout rooms, which will be uh, small groups of like seven to ten people um, in each group and we're hoping that that will be a good size for some more you know open conversation. There isn't an agenda for this um, other than you know talking about what we've been hearing from the panelists and what's going on in your communities so um, your this is just a space for you to connect with some other community members. It's going to be loosely sorted by topic based on the registration information you've given us. So we've tried to put people interested in sing talking about singing with others and people interested in dancing with the, the same. So hopefully that will work for you. Um, and we're going to run that for 10 minutes. I think it's going to say 15 on this slide and we're going to make that a little shorter because we're running a little bit late. Um, so yeah, go for it. And then we'll bring you back here afterwards uh, if you stick around for Katie to do a couple of closing words. So um, unless anyone else has any other interjections, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you all in your own little rooms. Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you've had You've been having good conversations in your little groups. So we'll just take a second to get everyone back in the main channel. Well, that was short. I hope it was short and sweet. So I have to go look up everybody's contact information so we can continue our conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, as um, much fun as these web chats are, they are imperfect in, in finishing conversations. We really hope that a lot of conversations continue um, beyond just right now and tonight. Yeah, ours uh, I think was just getting started. All right, Crispin, how are we looking? Are people mostly back in? Uh, I think I think we've got everyone back in now. Great. Thank you all so much for um, sticking through uh, this long session, um, for everything that you are doing to keep your communities connected and supported uh, during this time. I want to give a special thank you to our guest speakers today. They really appreciated hearing um, their candid perspectives on dance safety. And I want to reaffirm that this was not meant to be the answer to all questions, but the beginning of conversations that I hope we can continue happen, having together and helping each other learn as the whole country learns more and more about the virus. So again, thank you. If you want to continue, share your information, go to Shared Weight, join one of those discussion groups. Um, keep at it. All right. If you want to unmute and say goodbye, go for it. This is your chance.